Thank you. Nice to see so many of you for this talk about artificial intelligence, which I will introduce. And I will start off by telling a story. It's a <coughs> science fiction short story written in the late 50s, I think, or early 60s. And it's about uh, humanity has spread out. It's far, far in the future, like really far in the future. So humanity has spread out throughout the entire galaxy hundreds of thousands of planets, billion up a billion of people, and they decide to build the world's biggest computer. So it's networked, it's spread out in the known universe, it gets its source of power from stars, and it takes generations to build. And then on the eve of inauguration, the head scientist walks up and flips a giant switch, as you do in the future, and asks the most cliche question, ever, is there a god? To which the computer replies, now there is. And I thought it was funny, but it's also interesting because when Mary Shelley kick-started the whole sci-fi genre, it was like a warning that humans shouldn't pretend to be gods by creating life. And now we sort of move past that and we're not content at creating life anymore, we're creating gods. But the story continues for a few more lines and it's like, the head scientist dives for the switch to turn it off, the computer, that is, and there's a flash of lightning from a clear sky, kills the scientist and fuses the switch shut. And that narrative is still with us today, as I will tell you more about in a minute. But first things first, AI, artificial intelligence, the term itself has become somewhat meaningless because people are using it in so many different ways, often misattributing things that aren't strictly artificial intelligence. So it's such a big problem actually that people have started coming up with new terms we could use instead of saying AI. So hard AI or strong AI, but they both sound kind of silly actually. It's like compensating for something maybe, but there's a really cute one that I kind of like, artificial general intelligence, because it sounds so basic, it's like, oh, that's just some general intelligence. But what is general intelligence? Well, <coughs> if you can spot the connection between the image on the right and the image on the left, that's general intelligence. Like my eldest son did when he was eight. Actually, 902 days after he saw these colorful snails, he was making some slime, coloring it with food coloring stuff. And he said to me, Dad, <coughs> I think those snails were fed food coloring. And I said, yeah, yeah, I think so too, but why do you think that? And he said, well, I read in this book, he had one of these uh, 1001 funny facts for kids. He said, flamingos turn pink because they eat this little shrimp that has a really strong coloring agent in its shells. So when it digests the shells, the feathers turn pink, and that's why flamingos in captivity become whitish. So he can make that connection between different living things. Snails are living things, and so are flamingos. Flamingos can change color depending on what they eat. Therefore, maybe snails can do that too. And food coloring color stuff, so maybe if we use that to feed the snails, they will change. That's general intelligence. Right? You know about life, you know living things eat stuff. And you realize that stuff can affect you. And computers can't do this yet. And that would be what they used to call AI, which is now artificial general intelligence. And another term people like to talk about is the singularity. I'm sure most of you know this already, but I'm going to run through it anyway. Here's a chart of intelligence where humans are over here and machines used to be over there, we say. It's not like a real graph, it's just an illustration. Anyway, we've been working at making <coughs> our machines smarter and we're bringing them closer and closer there. We came out of the AI winter and the theory goes that we bring it all the way up here and that's when we reach the singularity. And all of humankind will gather to celebrate the birth of AI. Then what happens? Like we made something that became as smart as us, 
Therefore, it should be able to make itself smarter. And since it's a machine, it can work tirelessly day and night, much, much faster than humans can. So it will start leaving us behind and even falling off this very non-scientific chart. But we're still stuck over there. <coughs> so the question is, what about us? Well, like that scientist with the switch, there's some theories about that. One popular theory is that we're going to be turned into straws or stamps. Okay, it's not the theory, but it's like a story, <coughs> right? So someone gets this super smart machine and it says, I really like strawberries. Could you make me as many strawberries as possible? So we go out in the garden and start planting strawberries and pretty soon we realize I need a bigger garden so I can plant more strawberries because then I will get more strawberries. And pretty soon we'll notice that there's humans everywhere and then in the way and humans can become pretty good fertilizers. So we start grinding all the humans down, tearing down our houses and then fertilize their endless strawberry field and there will be no humans left but plenty of strawberries. So this sounds silly, but it's some pretty smart people that use this example to say we shouldn't really pursue general artificial intelligence. That's a bit of a mouthful. <coughs> so this could be the worst event in the history of our civilization, says Stephen Hawking and others. But we're not there yet. What we do have is machine learning. And I think machine learning is pretty darn impressive already. And a good example to illustrate machine learning is to talk about Google Photos. You know Google Photos, it goes through all your photos and then makes them searchable by keyword. So here I typed in flower bouquet and these are the results. There were many more flower bouquets. And this is super useful for me because I got a lot of photos, like 141,655 and that's growing. So I'm really grateful for this. And this is why when you thought, oh, 902 days, how could you know that it took your son 902 days to figure that food coloring stuff out? Well, I just typed, his name is Anton, and I knew there were some turtles in the pictures. So I typed that in, and Google returned this result, and I got the date. And then I wrote Anton Chemistry. He was making slime, and he looked really cool with his protective goggles that he really should be wearing in front of his eyes, but anyway. And then I could calculate the difference, and it's really simple. But imagine doing this with 140 whatever photos, and trying to sift through them and find out, oh, honey, I remember we were in Beijing and looked at those snails. Was it in? It's impossible. Now it's a matter of three minutes, and I'm done. So how do you do this? Well, you all know this. You need label data. It's just what it sounds like. It's data in this instance, it's an image and a label, so towers, right? Uh, actually, it's just one tower, but anyway. And whenever you see, I'm going to use this setup a few times throughout the presentation. So there's a square image and a square label, and these are real examples that uh, in my Google Photos, the things folder, if you click on it, there will be all these labeled things that Google has found for you. So this is an actual example of Google looking at the picture saying that's towers and it's correct in this case. But then you need lots and lots and lots of label data to train an algorithm. And this is <coughs> from last year at Google I.O. There's 1.2 billion photos and videos uploaded to Google Photos every day. And that's a lot of pictures, right? And that's twice as much as the year before. This year, they didn't want to talk about collecting data for some reason. Don't know why. Anyway, I know what you're all thinking, right? You're not labeling any photos. Are you sure about that? I mean, you're all seeing this where you sit and label stuff for Google, right? And I, there's no coincidence it's a heavy focus on traffic because they're training their Waymo machine learning algorithms and you're helping them. And if that isn't enough, and if you're as sad as I am, you found this image labeling thing. Have you found that yet? Anyone else? No, just me. It's a Google thing where you can help them label images. It's like a little game if you're extremely geeky. So 
Here I select playgrounds. Is this a playground? Yes or no? Uh, no. This? No. And then it goes on and on. And this is, it collects these images. They're all uh, Creative Commons images that they get mostly from Flickr, I think. So it's not your Google Photos. Those are trained by Google employees. And if that isn't available to you, like building a tool like that, you can do what Expensify did. You know, you could scan your receipt and their machine learning algorithm would find out, so, okay, what's the VAT, where did you buy this, what date, how much was it? Actually, it was done by people who get paid peanuts using what's it called, Amazon Virtual Mechanical Turk. So they use that in the hopes of one day they won't need those people anymore because their algorithms have become good enough that they don't have to pay people for it. And then what? What do you do once you got your labeled data? Well, then you build a neural network. <coughs> and this is where I have to admit that I don't have a degree in mathematics. I tried to watch many YouTube videos where they explain neural networks. And it always starts off very good, like, oh, you need labeled data, and it's all very simple and clear, and then they end up here, and I'm saying, oh, God, what is that? Until I found this one video where they explain it, it's actually really simple. Neural network works like this. Let's pretend we want to buy an apartment, something a lot of people want or have done, and you want to know how much is it worth, right? So one way would be to gather a lot of data about it, so how big is it, where is it, when was it built, are there any shops nearby, like what's the neighborhood like, and then you apply weight to those values, so we all know location, 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 that's probably pretty important, so we say this is important, and maybe shops aren't that important, so let's say we take that value times five and we divide that by two. And then you get more data, as much as you can find that you think is relevant, and you apply weights to all of them, and then you calculate a number. And this isn't a neural network, this is just an algorithm, like pretty basic one. So what you do instead is that you select a few of them that sort of relate to each other, and you calculate the new value, so that's the bang for the buck in the neighborhood, and style and economy, you can make up as many of these as you want to, and they're still weighted, right? Each of these has a weight, and the weight could vary. So as you see here, the address, location, 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 it's important. It will be in two different values, but you could weight differently on the different nodes. So these are the nodes and this is the network and now you see the neural network and then you keep on building layers as many as you can or want to feel necessary and then in the end you get the new value right so now you can see it basically this but i made it super simple obviously there's more to it than that like you have to normalize the values and there's some filters and stuff thresholds and they look like this, maybe, when they're illustrated, or they're pointing up, but it's the same thing, doesn't matter which way you point it. And then you make a bunch of these, or rather you create a bunch of weights on them, and you have to know the answer. This is the label data. You need to know what is this supposed to be. Well, it's supposed to be 12. And then you apply some weights over there, and some different weights down here, and then you see, oh, Nine, well, that's close, but it's not really. How much did you get? 10,000, okay, you're way off. So maybe change this a lot and that a little bit. And then we'll see what happens. Oh, 11 and 15, and it's getting close, and then you can sort of cross-pollinate them and do a bunch of things that I can't tell you about. But this is basically how it works. And this is neural networks. And this is what basically everything that we call machine learning is built on. And then we have to talk about AlphaGo because that's the biggest thing that happened last year. You know, Go is this ancient Chinese game they've been playing for thousands of years. And it's not that complicated. This is the entire rule set 
Like this is everything in one slide. So it's not that the rules are super complicated. That's not the challenge. The challenge is that each turn consists of a guy or a girl taking a black or a white stone and placing it on the intersection, any free intersection, basically, on the board. And then you take turns doing that until one person is the winner or there's no more point to it all. It's an obvious winner. So the reason why Go, the game, was considered unlearnable by a machine is not that the rules are hard, because they're not. The reason is that there's more possible combinations than there are atoms in the known universe. So if you were to try and write a rule for how to play Go well, it's impossible, right? Because there's so many different variations of it. Like, so they say you have to develop a feel for it. You have to be creative. You have to be able to be inventive. And machines can't do those things, right? Like an example of a rule, you all know this. How do you get out of a maze? Well, you walk forward with your right hand on one wall, and you will get out of the maze. It's just one simple rule, and it would look something like this. It's not the best way to do it but it will get you out of a true maze. Then there are fake mazes and there are labyrinths, and in labyrinths you can't get lost. Anyway, moving on, this would be a rule, right? Follow this rule and you will succeed. It's impossible to write that for Go, the game of Go. So what they did instead was what they like to call compute. It would be the equivalent of saying, walk every possible way in this maze and measure each one of them, and then return all the answers and sort them and take the shortest one. Like, it's brute force, but they say compute because it sounds nicer than brute force. And this is pretty significant. And it's funny, this, um, funny, it's sort of sad. Rich Sutton, he's been working with machine learning for many, many years, and he wrote this, uh, it's about two pages long, called The Bitter Lesson. I strongly urge you to Google it and read it. But you can summarize it pretty easily. So he's saying that going back, looking at 70 years of insight from machine learning research, I've reached the conclusion that Compute beats rules, or compute rules, if you want to be cute, and by a large margin. So don't try to be smart. Don't be fancy. Just chuck as much processing power at it as you can until the computer solves the problem in a way you probably won't understand. Which leads us to the infamous move 37 in the AlphaGo game. It's not pro evil moment number 37. It's where, this is Lee Sedol, he was ranked, I think he was first or second in the world. And AlphaGo said, we, wanna <coughs> we want you to play our algorithm. Like, could you do that? Five games? Yep, yeah, sure, thing, he said. And there's a documentary about it that I, I can recommend. It's good, isn't it? Huh? I haven't actually seen it. There's clips of it on YouTube, and I will show you a clip right now. So, in the first game, AlphaGo won, and everyone was kind of surprised. But he said, yeah, yeah, it was a good game. It played a nice, um, somewhat mechanical and dry game. But yeah, it's interesting. Now we're going to beat it for the rest, like four more matches, and I'm going to win them all. So now he's been out smoking, taking it cool. He comes back in. Meanwhile, AlphaGo, which is the algorithm, has placed the 37th stone, and this is his reaction when he sits down and looks at the board to see what has happened. And then he sat like that for about 20 minutes, thinking. So it's like someone seeing an alien. It's like he encountered what he thought was impossible because they're saying move 37 was so creative so groundbreaking, so out of the box, that no one had ever thought about placing a stone there. And it's quite interesting looking up why it was so weird, because if you don't play Go, like me, you don't really get it. But, I mean, he got it, and he's shocked. And this is us looking at the smart machine. And all of a sudden, this is sort of, oh my god, it's, the machines are coming. 
So we switch track and think about something nice for a while. <coughs> mountains in China, very peaceful, very nice. I like walking in mountains in China. And whenever I walk there, I go like, do you know who else really likes walking in mountains in China? Taoists. They build their temples everywhere. There's even a tiny one up there. So I thought, okay, if I like walking in mountains in China and Taoists like walking in mountains in China, then maybe I should check up what Taoism is all about. <coughs> First thing I learned was that it's actually a Taoism. Uh, second thing was that my favorite author, Ursula K. Le Guin, has uh, written a translation of uh, what we in Sweden call Tao Te Ching, it's Tao Te Ching. <coughs> so I bought this, it's a very slim book, it's not much to it, it's really good. And uh, I found this quote that I really like, to know enough's enough is enough to know. And it, I, I think it's just brilliant, it works, it's sort of like a circular, you could also say, to know enough is enough, is enough to know. Like, this is my limit, no further, or is it just, you know, it, I really liked it, and I wanted to quote it, and I forgot it. So I went to the internet to look it up, as one does, and I found this translation instead by someone else. Therefore, the sufficiency of contentment is an enduring and unchanged. So, so I'm so glad I didn't buy that book, because I wouldn't have been able to finish it. Which made me think, okay, so what's the literal translation? What's the original? So I went to Google to find it. This is in, in Chinese. Uh, yeah, I shouldn't try to pronounce it. Anyway, I ran it in Google Translate, and this is what came out. Refresher of the foot often enough, which is sort of weird. How did that go from... Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? And it reminded me of this famous quote by a, uh, what's it called, the, 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 the speech recognition master. Every time I fire a linguist, the performance of the speech recognizer goes up. And I thought, yeah, if that's all you can do, really? But, okay. So you see, this is the original, and this is what computers can do. This is the literal translation, right? And then someone who understands China and knows a bit about history and knows the context of Tao Te Ching can translate it to this. And then you ask someone with a really good grasp of the English language and a bit of creativity who also studied Taoism for quite a while, and she came up with this. And my point here is, so far, this is where computers are getting us. So maybe we shouldn't be too scared. But at the same time, you know, it's easy to laugh at this guy, but he has a point, and he's talking about compute. Don't try any fancy rules. Just chuck processing power at it. And now to become a bit serious about it all, this is another very famous quote that I like quoting. We shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. And I think that a lot of time we sort of given up, we think that we've built this wonderful machine that is perfect and now we can rely on AI to solve all our, all our problems. And I don't think so. I used to think, oh, this is perfect. We have, well, let's put the AI in courts. Let's put machine learning on who should get social benefits and who shouldn't because it's unbiased. I don't agree with that at all anymore because I think we're sort of confused, unwavering with unbiased. Because I think algorithms are bias written in stone. And there are plenty of examples of this. And there's plenty of problems with relying on algorithms and machine learning. And this one, there was a paper where neural networks learn to identify criminals by their faces. It's not face recognition. It's not like they can look at the wanted poster and then find that person. Right? There's that as well. This is by looking at all the mugshots of criminals, it can then find other criminals, right? My problem with this isn't really the fact that Google Photos think this is penguins instead of snow troopers on a strawberry cake. It believes this is a skateboard, okay, whatever. That's problematic. My real problem is now it's big, test on all of you. On the next night, there will be four images. You will have to guess which one is a birthday party, right? One, two, three. 
Okay, you'll probably guess this one. It is a birthday party. That's correct. And Google Photos got it. It's definitely a birthday party, but it's a trick question. They're all birthday parties because this is what birthday parties look like nowadays. Right? But someone decided, no, 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 a birthday party is a cake with candles and maybe some box presents and a kid, you know, ready to blow out the candles. So the question when you see this, when I read this, it's not like, yeah, why is it even possible? It's like, what is a criminal anyway? And that's a big question. Has anyone in here ever been drunk in a bar other than me? Is it just me? Oh, it's just me. For those on YouTube, it's just me. Okay, so we're all criminals in Alaska because it's illegal to be drunk in a bar in Alaska. Again, for a good reason. The sheriff said we have three problems in Alaska. It's alcohol, alcohol, and alcohol. So it all makes sense, right? But should anyone who's ever been drunk in a bar then be part of that training set of what a criminal looks like? Well, it depends, doesn't it? It depends on what? Well, it's the person who writes the code. Because they will encode their idea of what the criminal is. And then it's locked away and really hard to get to. And this is a growing problem, right? Because not only is it tough to read code, right? Many of these people who are writing, they right now using systems like this to decide if, should this guy go to jail for a long time or a short time, right? They're using machine learning for that. And then when they ask, could we see the code? The company who has created the code would say, no, it's our intellectual property. We can't give it away. That's ours. You can't read it. And <laughs> that's really tough. So, I mean, that's why they always use images. It says moon, and it's a picture of soap bubbles in front of a blue sky. I, I can look at that and say, yeah, I can see why you thought that was a moon, right? But when it starts to become complex issues, and everyone trusts machines all the time, then we have a problem. And it's a growing problem. Machine learning is causing a science crisis. And now we're going to break all the rules and present you with a wall of text. But I'm going to try and walk you through it slowly, bit by bit. So this is from that article. A growing amount of scientific research involves using <coughs> machine learning software to analyze data that has already been collected. The answers they come up with are likely to be inaccurate or wrong because the software is identifying patterns that exist only in that data set and not the real world. Machine learning algorithms have been developed specifically to find interesting things, patterns in data sets. So when they search through a huge amount of data, they will inevitably find a pattern because that's what we've told them to do. And they have no idea about what's important and what's not important. And you all see these examples, right? The divorce rate in Maine correlates with the per capita consumption of margarine. So the less margarine you eat, the better your marriage is. Like we can all, that's not true. But there's a correlation, so maybe, should we look into this? Yeah, if my grant depends on it, then maybe. Yeah, <clears throat> so this is something people are trying to tra tackle. How can we query the machine? How can we get it to tell us why it made the decision that it made. And uh, Google talked about testing with concept activation vectors at this year's I.O. So there's a zebra, and here's the model. You recognize the model. This time it's pointing up and has two dimensions, three, three dimensions, let's say, three, yes. And what you can do with the TCAV, as they call it, is you can ask, is stripes important? Are horses important for your understanding of these images in zebra? Savannah, like you might say, oh, 10 to 2%, but that's really stupid. And I, I'm going to show you a link to a different talk by an actual math professor. And she has some really funny examples of why you shouldn't put the environment into the decision. And let's do some more funny stuff. Hey, what's this? Does anyone dare to guess? You all think I'm going to trick you, right? Yeah. It is actually a banana. It's not the pipe thing. It's a banana. But now I'm going to make it a little bit harder, right? So what's this? Well, if you ask a machine, 
it would say, oh, it's a toaster. And now once I've said it, you can see, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah, yeah, that looks like a toaster. <laughs> we'll completely disregard the banana and just go, oh, yeah, toaster. It used to be banana, now it's a toaster because you put that thing there. And this is funny, we can laugh about, ah, oh, stupid machines, but then you put these stickers on the road and all of a sudden this Tesla whirs straight into oncoming traffic and it's not so funny anymore. And everyone goes, ooh, oh no, this was supposed to solve all the traffic accidents. Well, <coughs> funny example again, yoga. No, it's not yoga, we can see it's not yoga. Sad example. This city in Alaska is warming so fast, algorithms removed the data because it seemed unreal, right? Algorithms didn't remove that data, a human did. Probably for a good reason. Like we all, anyone who's ever worked with sensors know that sometimes they go a bit wonky. So it makes sense to remove the both ends of the bell curve that's sort of outside the spectrum. It makes perfect sense until it doesn't make sense at all. And this is pretty important data that we need right now. If stuff is warming up so fast, it's outside of the bell curve, the machines better tell us about it. IBM's Watson supercomputer recommended unsafe and incorrect cancer treatments, internal documents show. Sad. But then there's the positive things, and I, I want to be positive anyway, like they reduce energy consumption by 30% using machine learning and detecting over 50 eye diseases, like there's a lot of good things we can do with machine learning. But we shouldn't forget that machine learning is a tool after all, and it's really important how we use that tool and that we understand that tool and that we don't blindly trust that tool. And on that, I'm gonna leave you. This was, this is where I work. We, if you found it interesting in any way, we have a podcast where we talk about stuff like this. And I also promise to show you some, like take a picture of this. This is really good. And this is the one where she explained neural networks that I based my explanation of neural net networks on. And yeah, that's it for me. Thank you very much.